and we'll be in chapter 4. I have a few verses this morning. You're welcome to go to them as I read them, but I, I won't delay too long with them. Uh, John 4 and verse number 30. If you'll follow along as I read, then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Anybody brought him anything to eat? Has he, has he eaten? 34, Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. Say not ye there are yet four months and then come at the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white, all ready to harvest. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. How precious it is, is to us as we look at our master, our commander, our captain of our salvation. Father, to follow him, the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that we would uh, follow him this morning, literally in the footsteps of his will. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I want you to notice the phrase there. He says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. If you were to move from that passage to chapter 5 of John, in verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just. Of course, our Lord is speaking. I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Same chapter, verse 38. And ye have not, you have not the, his word abiding in you for whom he hath sent, yet you believe not. I'm sorry, verse, uh, gave you the wrong verse there. Speaking about the will of God this morning and following and knowing the will of God in our lives something that we as believers desire, but sometimes we think that it does elude us somewhat and not knowing, am I following in the will of God? And we see Jesus Christ as he came to earth and we find over and over again in the scriptures that we're gonna find these passages about the will of God. Verse 38, it says, for I come down out from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. I will tell you that Everything that Jesus Christ did, if you read the New Testament through or the Gospels, you're going to find that over and over again he is challenged and he repeats often in the scriptures that he came to do the will of the Father. Sometimes he would say, I don't speak anything unless the Father tells me to speak it. Everything I speak is from God. I don't do things on my own. We find him even in the Garden of Gethsemane as we see, not as I will, Jesus says, speaking of the cross to come, not as I will, but what? As thou wilt always in submission to the will of God in his life. And obviously the perfect example for us to follow was the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow the will of God and follow in our master's footsteps. He says in this passage, he says, my desire, my thirst, he says, my meat. And I think of that in the concept of, of, of hunger or desire, right? And they're thinking, what, anybody bring, bring him anything to eat? When's the last time he's ate? We saw in one passage in the scriptures, not this morning, but where the, where the family came and literally tried to rescue him because he was so surrounded by people for long spans of time, they, they feared for his health. And of course, he rejected their offer. But in this case, the disciples are, are trying, thinking he hasn't ate anything. And he lets them know that this is not, this is not my desire, this is not my thirst, this is not my appetite. My thirst, my desire, everything that is my drive in my life here, the short span of 33 and a half years, 
is about one thing. It is about doing the will of the Father while I'm here. I want to complete the will. I want to finish his work. So we're looking at everything to the cross. Certainly our Lord ate while he was on earth, but this is an illustration that he's given to his disciple. This is not my driving passion. There is nothing else in my life that drives me like the will of God, Christ said. There's nothing you could offer me. You think I missed a meal, that's a big deal. It's not a big deal. What I came to do was the will of God, and what I was doing was the will of God, and while I was fulfilling the will of God, that was bringing me entire satisfaction. Probably never thought much about the food until they approached him with it. It's an amazing thing how our Lord was so given to follow after God perfectly, without sin, 33 and a half years knowing that the cross was in his future. It's an amazing thing to have an appetite in life that is so driving that everything else, everything in our life would be servant to the will of God in our lives. Boy, don't we wish we could say that this morning, that we didn't do things in our own will, our own way, our own timing, that everything we did was exactly the way God would have us do it. Can you, as we follow the life of Christ, of course, uh, his birthplace in Bethlehem, but as we follow him, you realize there's not a moment in the life of this child, this man, that has not been with any sin in it. It hasn't been his own desires. It has been under the tutelage of his parents, no doubt, as they, obedience to his parents, and then we find him as they take him into the city, and where do they find him? They can't find him. They're, they're scavenging all over the city trying to find him. Where do they find him? They find him into the temple. And of course, they're a bit upset. And he said, don't you know I need to be about my father's business? His life was committed to the will of the father all the way to the cross. In Philippians chapter 2, I find an interesting passage that I'll read you here. Verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took on him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So we see our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what the request is from God. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It is one step, every step, in the will of God. What an example he has set for us. A verse that we often associate and know probably is the most popular verse in the context of the will of God would be, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I realize that we are going to struggle in life with the perfect, and sometimes maybe we look at it and maybe we're not, we're not going to get it acceptable, but we'd like to get the good, right? We'd like to get the perfect will of God. But God is, God's goal for us is that we be in his will and in his way and our desire of our heart, the thirst of our heart, the longing of our heart would not be for these other things, but they would be for the will of God in our life. Someday when we face God, what a moment that would be to exchange with the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ went to heaven, everything he did his entire life was perfectly within the will of God and he finished his course. Apostle Paul said, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. Could we be those people who finish our course and throughout our lives we have focused and the life we have left that we would focus is this something that would please the Lord is this within the will of God for my life or am I just completely running my own course in my own way in my own time missing out on the perfect will of God we start with being born again transformed by Christ through salvation and what a transformation it is from death to life, from following after the works of the flesh and Satan and the world, and then we turn our eyes and we're focused upon the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and we walk somewhat of a tattered path being pulled between the flesh and the world and the devil and trying to follow perfectly and the best as we would follow the Lord Jesus Christ realizing that we fail so often. I'll read to you 2 Timothy 3, 16. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning we have in our hands the Word of God, the Bible. And what we find, you say, Pastor, how can I know the will of God? How can I be sure I'm doing the will of God? What does the will of God look like for average Joe American getting up and going to work every day, which describes most of us, even if you work at the church, you do have to, you you got to get up and come to work, right? It describes most of us, we're we're in a life that we're we're working and, and we see this passage of Scripture in Timothy here, what a great passage it is that we would follow after the will of God and follow these scriptures. It tells us that scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, profitable for us. And it comes to the last phrase of 17, and it, it fully is a full source of your Christian life comes from the Bible. It is a flourishing and it will make your life flourish as a believer to know the scriptures. I um, would challenge you, get to every service that you possibly can get to. Be here. You, Sunday school, Sunday, there's, there's four services a week. You want to be thoroughly furnished, the Bible calls it in 17. Verse 17, thoroughly furnished. You want to be that believer who is not just stagnated, un- unaware of the will of God and unknowing and, and not even concerned with the will of God. But as we come to the scriptures, we find that we can be thoroughly furnished in the will of God. And how do we get that thoroughness? How do we achieve per- perfection? Of course, the word perfect is a word that is meaning mature. How do we mature in the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ? How can we be profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness? It comes from the Bible. That is how we are going to live our life. And you say, well, what shall I read? I would tell you the epistles are a place that you need to just spend much of your time in. It's obviously the New Testament. It comes from primarily not only him. Of course, Peter and John, Jude, James. But we have a lot of writings, the Apostle Paul to the church of whom we are. The the Gospels, all these come together for us as believers to be thoroughly furnished. The Old Testament, the admonishment from the Old Testament. But as a New Testament believer, come to know these passages, these epistles very well. Because it is the guidelines for our lives, it's for the church, it's for our eternity. The Old Testament, as you know, I preach from it often. It is an admonishment, and the lessons from the Old Testament are endless for us. It's not a diminishing of the old. But understand, if you're going to be thoroughly furnished, you need to understand these epistles and what it is we as believers, how we are supposed to come to God and how we are supposed to live our lives, how our church is supposed to operate. And all these things are contained, supported consistently by the Old Testament It's rare that you don't read an epistle that Apostle Paul or Peter is bringing what? The Old Testament into the mix, showing us that it's always been this way. It's always been the example for us. And so we combine the two as New Testament believers. But if you're new in the faith, I would would tell you, read those epistles. Understand the thing that God wants for us as believers and how we operate, how we treat each other, how our marriages and all these things are contained for us so much for us to gain and glean. Why? So we can be thoroughly furnished. We can know the word. So the more you know the word of God, the more you can operate. I could take you out if you're somebody and you've never never played basketball. Or you say you don't know baseball. I suppose perhaps the one I think is most difficult that often, you know, children and, and most ladies do, but some ladies, football doesn't make any sense to them. 
You know, it just it just doesn't can't can't quite figure out what's going on with with football with the four downs and there's all kinds of things going on in football. And so, if we get to, uh, people together on any sports you want, and they say, "Well, I've never played it before," ah, don't worry about it. Just come out on the field. You know, you got a guy on one. You get picking guys. You you guys ever play pickup games in fields and stuff when we were kids? I don't I don't know if they still do that or not, but we just we just did it every day. No kidding. And we would just whatever number of guys we could get together, we had some kind of a game. You know, you didn't you couldn't hit it in right field, or you. You know, you'd pick a place you couldn't hit it. You were automatically out if you did. So we figured out a way to play the game. But, you know, if a guy came and he said, oh, I never played baseball before. You got a mitt with you? No, I don't have a mitt. We're not picking him for my team. You know what I mean? I hope the other guy gets him, right, because he has no clue about baseball. He picked that in his sport. Ladies, you, you can, you know, the variety of things that ladies are involved with. I mean, obviously, when you're, you're doing things, you like to have somebody that has some idea of what's going on. Amen. And you'd like them to be have to have some skills uh, when when they get together. The the men that uh, cook breakfast down there, they, they're a very skilled group of guys. And if you don't know what you're doing in there, stay out of the way, because they do. And uh, so, but you you understand the nature of it. If if you go into the kitchen and you know your way around the kitchen, guess what? You fit in very, very well because you understand what's going on. If you play a game that somebody you've never played before and you don't know what's going on, how do you learn it? You, you, the scriptures are giving us how to live the Christian life. You say, Pastor, how am I going to know I'm in the will of God? The more you understand this book, the more you understand what God has for us. And so that you are walking in the will of God. Why? Because you know and understand this book. And you've come to know it. You, you've read it. And you understand how it applies to your life and how important it is for your life to be profitable for God, number one, and to do his will. So that you could, could, could be good and acceptable and perfect will of God in your life. You're not just walking through life thinking, hi, I wonder if I'm supposed to do this. I you know, the Holy Spirit of God is going to work with you internally with those things. But the knowledge of what the Holy Spirit is going to convict you is going to come from the word of God. And so Christians... In order to accomplish the will of God in your life, you need to be pretty well growing in the faith and in the knowledge of the scriptures. So why? So I know that I'm walking in the will of God. Sometimes, you know, new believers are involved in things that they just don't, they just don't know any better. Amen? They just, they just don't know. And it's so, it's certainly... There's no judgment on those things from anyone. We understand they're a new believer. We expect that. You know, you don't expect, you don't expect a, a child that's five years old, you know, to be, to be out doing the things his teenage brothers are doing. I was in that situation. My brother Terry was 15 years older with me, than me. And uh, my brother, uh, I'm sorry, was 10 years older. My brother Ron was five years older. So, man, when you're playing games, you get hurt a lot when you're the, you're the distant child like I was, thankfully. Now I'm the youngest, and it's good. Uh, I knew someday that would pay off. And uh, so now I just go beat them up for what they did to me when I was a kid. Not really. They'd probably still take me. Know the word of God. What, it, what that will do, that will bring into the context of living your life in God's will. Who do I marry? If you understand the word of God, guess what? Who do I date? If you understand the Bible, you understand who do I date. Do you understand you can be um, decisions that you're going to make in life. If you understand the Bible and you're walking with God, you're seeking the will of God, and you're praying about things, how to operate a home, all the things of life that are going to have context to them and how you handle them based on how you know the scriptures, how you deal with people in business. How are you, if you know the scriptures, what are you going to be? You're going to be a just man. You're going to be an honest man. You're not going to be a man that rips people off. You're not going to be a man that's, I try to be careful about not trying to, um, I, I, some people take delight in it, and I, I have no problem with that. My wife is one of them. But uh, if she can get a good deal, it's, it's, she loves that. She loves to get a good deal. And sometimes like those garage sales or something, boy, she'll do them down. I'm like, honey, they want a dollar. Just give them the buck, you know. <laughs> she'll offer them 50 cents. I'm like, please, don't, don't give them 50 cents. Four people have been standing out here in the sun all day. Give them a buck, you know. But, oh, man, she, she loves a good deal. And I, I don't, I'm not a very good negotiator, right? And, uh, but, it, you know, it's the things in life is, 
is as you gain knowledge of the Bible, it, it helps you on how to handle day-to-day -day operations in your life. What I watch on TV, if you understand the Word of God, you'll, you'll have guidelines for what you should be doing. Rock music that's on many, many of these video games now. Parents, be careful of that. You're going you're gonna to cause your kid to have such an appetite for rock music. I've told you this illustration before, but a young man that was, I worked with in a church, and he said the hardest thing of all the things that he quit was rock music. That was the hardest thing to give up. Just, it's, it's addictive. And I noticed the, the games and whatnot have a lot, of, a lot of rock music in them. You're developing a taste and an appetite and a non-understanding that that's not appropriate for a Christian to listen to. See what I mean, Pastor? I'll introduce me to the rock musician, and maybe you've got one you know of, that's not um, doing things that are inappropriate, anti-God, anti-Bible, drugs, sexuality, all these things they've been known for this since the beginning of the rock movement. It's never been any different, and I'm certain it's not any different today. And they've spread their cause way faster than we've spread ours because they have the whole world now, half or half of USA, believing that everything's okay. The, the debauchery that started with that crowd. So parents, be careful with these things. Believers, be grounded in the word of God so that the Holy Spirit can lead you and you have the knowledge of the Bible on how to react and how to run your life and how to be in the will of God. So when we see Jesus Christ walking in the will of God, how was he able to do that as a man? He's able to do it as a man because he literally is the word. He is the word of God. And so he is walking in the will of God perfectly because of his knowledge of the word of God. And he literally is. Many decisions made every day. Are they wholly acceptable unto the Lord? Is the Bible your baseline for walking in God's will? Parents, your top priority is raising godly children. You've got a lot of things going on in life. But always prioritize raising godly children is what God has commanded you to do. And understand that is, that is what he's brought you to do. You've got to work. You've got to put food on the table. There's, there's many, many got to do's. But the got to do that you really have to do that you only get one shot at is raising your children. And then it's over. It's gone. It's done. And the turnout of that will be something that you will possess the rest of your life. However they turn out. Whatever they are, they will be with you. What you have opportunity now while they're young is the greatest opportunity you'll have. It is the passion of your life. Nothing replaces it. You can't buy it back. You can't do anything to replace it. They're your children. You have young children. Give your, give your life to these children of course, Christ is always first, but you put Christ first, that's going to bring you to having your children follow in the footsteps of mom and dad. You need to have a renewed mind through Christ and his word. Let this mind be in you, which was what? Also in Christ Jesus. It is the mind of God. It's the mind of the word of God. Sometimes we say, how do I know if I'm in the will of God? You'll know it because you know the word of God and you know you're not in violation of it. And you know that it is the will of God. You're going to be making decisions your life as the Holy Spirit would lead you, but your knowledge and the Spirit ability to convict you of things that you should not be doing is based on knowledge of the Bible. Again, I say, get to all the services you possibly can because it's when the Bible is going to be taught and it's going to be preached and it's going to be challenging to you. Uh, it's just a, a vital thing for us if we're going to walk in the will of God. Our Savior walked every step in the will of God because he's the word of God. And you want to have that confidence that you're in his will. comes with a renewed mind. John 6.40 says this, and this is the will of him that sent me. Jesus Christ is speaking that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. These verses on the will of God, if you will look up the verses on the will of God, 
and where Jesus spoke of the will, you're going to find in the majority of those passages, they are going to lead you to one thing, and that's a salvation of souls. That is exactly what the will of God is, is that we are constantly giving the gospel, telling about Jesus Christ to people. That is always the will of God. The Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should go and be repentant. How shall they hear without a preacher? How are they going to know without us? How are they going to find out about Christ? And so understand that this is an important thing, that the will of God for Jesus Christ was always about the salvation of people. And that's what he pointed them to. If you look up the verses, even the ones we looked at, and you'll find that they take you to the gospel, as does this passage in 640. And this is the will of him that sent me. Who sent him? God. That everyone that sees the Son, that's Jesus, and believeth on him may have everlasting life. That is the will of the Father. He is not willing that any should perish. His will is that all would come to repentance and to salvation. Christians, this morning I would call on you. Sometimes we look at the will of God in the context of ministry, and that's certainly valid. But by and large, the bulk of the will of God we understand from the Word of God and what is his will, what is right, what is wrong. Our world is leading us in a path of there are no definites, there are no rights and wrongs, and on and on it goes. The word of God does give us those things. That's why it has been diminished. That's why they've taken it out of our schools. That's why they don't want anything to do with it, because it establishes the place of right and wrong. And it will always be that way. Right will always be right. And wrong will always be wrong, determined by God Almighty, the Creator. I don't know your condition this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed, let's stand together. We'll have our invitation. Christians, I admonish you this morning. Maybe challenge you. If you can come to more services, take that challenge. If you need to spend more time in the Word of God and not just reading quickly, but slowly digesting what the Bible says and learning it, applying it to your life so that you have knowledge of how to live in the will of God for your life. We'll have our invitation sung. If you don't know the Lord as your Savior, Pastor Nelson is here. There's always the right day. The, the day of salvation is always the right day is today. We'd love to have you come and trust him today.